Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Oliver, and thanks for being here. Um, My pleasure. I suppose the first thing that I'm inclined to say is that I have been a user and a customer of TeamViewer for some time. I suspect we can't because it's dark, we can't do a show of hands, but anybody out there who ever said help in front of a computer screen has been your friend and your customer. Yes. So it's been a long time, 2005. Mm -hmm. TeamViewer now is a very different company, but tell us in a sense, how did you get there before we talk too much about the future? Uh, I think what we got there by having a product which was geared towards helping other people on the computer, which as you say is a very positive experience. Yeah. If you get help on a computer, your problem is solved. And that was being done uh, by a piece of software that you downloaded to your computer. And you tell friends about it, and that's why uh, TeamViewer spread across the world. Uh, and was downloaded by now uh, by 1.8 billion people or devices, wow. uh, a big installed base, wow. and that's where it started. 1.8 billion. Yes, right. Wow. So at this point, um, TeamViewer, as we know, is very much uh, um, initially uh, remote control kind of intervention, solving problems. When the on-off switch doesn't work, what happens next? Yeah. Um, but over the last few years, TeamViewer has particularly evolved, and I think the current use cases are what really fascinate me. Right. I mean, the, the interesting thing about it is it's a, it's a reasonably easily accessible piece of software which customers download and then customers build their application and their use case around it. So they have this fantastic ability to connect every single device in every country, every operating system, old devices, new devices, and then they take this connectivity and do something with it. They automate processes or they uh, collect data, they control devices, and all of that has been developed over time by customers and therefore, as you say, very different use cases, huge customer base in many verticals with many different applications. And as an example of the sort of use cases, right now, um, um, where have you seen, most recently over the last year or so, where have you seen the biggest growth in those use cases? I think the biggest growth is currently really around uh, IoT, Internet of Things, okay. where it's really about collecting data and getting smarter about your installed base of devices uh, in production, in smart buildings, all of these different verticals, uh, and making use of that data for your to improve your production system. Okay, and just uh, as you heard earlier on, we're gonna take a couple of questions for Oliver at the end, towards the end of the session. So the Slido app and, and uh, SaaS Monster is the stage. So if you do have uh, some, let us know and we'll come back to them. So TeamViewer's evolution as a company has been a fascinating one. And you talk about the reach that you have. And you know, honestly, TeamViewer is probably one of the favorite brands that people have on the web because mm -hmm. it's a brand of help, it's a brand yeah. of assistance. Um, but you changed your business model along the way. And this has been an interesting evolution. And I suspect, is this what triggered sort of the explosion or the profitability and the revenue growth of TeamViewer? Yeah, I think over time, uh, it started, as I said, with a free product that uh, proliferated around the globe, really. Um, um, so we are active now in 200 countries or so. We're doing billings in 200 countries. So from that subscriber base, we slowly but surely convinced people to use it also for business purposes. Mm -hmm. And then we asked them to pay for the product. Mm -hmm. And that then led to, by now, I think a little bit more than 550,000 paying customers in all sizes, in all geographies, mm -hmm. with uh, offices in, in three regions, so to say. So wow. not much that we've done with it, but if you have this loyal customer base, and then you start to monetize and convince people to yeah. pay, actually people fall in two different buckets. One is the regular users, and they like to be with you and pay for a license and always mm. get the latest update. And the occasional users drop out at some point, which is totally fine. Uh, sure, I imagine your churn rate is probably quite low though. It's quite low, yeah, because yeah. once you are above this hill, so to say, to only take in people into the subscription model that are regular users, then the churn rate is really low. It's like below 10% really. Okay, wow, okay. You mentioned the regions that you're in. Has it been important in the growth of TeamViewer to establish regional offices, localized, kind of culturally aware workforces? Yeah, I think it's very important. And we're only at the beginning of that, frankly. We have been operating out of the headquarter in Germany, uh, where our heritage lies. Uh, then we opened an office in Australia and one in, uh, in the US to really cover those regions as well. But we're now going more local. We see that wherever we are on the ground and have a local marketing and sales team, um, the penetration is much higher. So we are, for example, we are in Australia, uh, which is the hub for APAC. But in Australia itself, we are very, very strong because of that. And therefore, we're replicating that into Japan, China, 
China, India, probably Latin America in the future as well. It's very important. Okay. Um, when you talked about the change to subscription billing, and I think we were all kind of aware of that, you know, maybe not when that happened, but yeah. it did. There was a curve, <laughs> yes, an inflection yes, point when this yes. certainly happened. What was your motivation? And can I ask you personally, were you fearful when you did that? Because you, you turn off the big money one and you turn on maybe yes, very what happens question. next. It's, it's a very good question. I think for us it was kind of natural because our delivery model was always a cloud solution. So mm. we provided a software that was downloaded and then uh, we maintained the software um, continuously. And therefore, for customers, it was very clear that this is a cloud model and the subscription pricing kind of made sense mm. for them. But they were used to pay once for a license and then uh, they could use the license for a long time. So mm. yes, very fearful before mm. you switch the large countries, mm. right? So our biggest market at the moment is the US. Mm. Second biggest market is Germany. And before you do the switch there, you better, you better try it out. So we did, pilot, uh, we did pilots in uh, Australia, UK and the Netherlands trying to find out the commercial model, the pricing, the buying behavior of customers. Mm. And then once we knew how it works uh, and that it works and that we can also adapt the processes of the company to it, then we changed aggressively. And when you then switch a country like uh, the US or Germany, it is a bit uh, frightening, yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned actually the uh, kind of acquiring those customers. Who do you market to? Where do you direct your message? Is it to end users? Is it to IT managers? Who makes the decision to say, it's time we put TeamViewer in as a support layer? How does that happen? Oh, it's very different by use case by now. Yeah. So originally, uh, the, the first decision maker that we were targeting were uh, uh, managed service providers, IT administrators, mm. uh, but then it, it grew uh, for new use cases. So now we are much more into operational processes, HR, finance, so where there is a use case of remote work, remote access, remote sensing, where there's a cost benefit mm. or better maintenance or easier processes. So we have to evolve as a company as well to talk to different decision makers over time. It's interesting, you mentioned a couple of uh, sectors or divisions within companies that are full of compliance. Yes. And so, um, GDPR yeah. and where you find yourselves now. How have you, I imagine a burden, but something you have to deal with, but what's your feeling generally within the support or the SaaS business? As you say, short-term burden, I would say long-term benefit probably. So it's, it's yeah. very important for us clearly to be compliant. Uh, we are a European-based company, so therefore GDPR is at the core of what we do. Mm. And it's an important message to customers all over the world, I have to say. I think, mm. it's a, I think in that sense, Europe is, is leading. Um, uh, it's complicated. You have to adapt many processes. Uh, you have to look at your data structures, your data policies and so forth. So not easy. Uh, and I think I can imagine for smaller companies, it's even more mm. difficult and could be very, very difficult. A financial um, burden. And financially, a financial burden as well. But then once you have it, people like the message that this is a European based company mm. with data centers and operations in Europe, mm. complying with GDPR. Mm. And I think that will spread and will be a competitive advantage going forward. Do you think that stands to you or is a benefit to you in other markets also? Yeah? Yes, I think yeah. so. And the, and the other markets follow, frankly, China, uh, the US. I mean, there's more and more data protection policies as yeah. well, which are actually quite comparable to what yeah. the, Europe, uh, the European Union has done. And therefore, I think it's good to work through this uh, and then be uh, with that competitive advantage in other markets as well. I couldn't help notice um, the team viewer, the fabulous team viewers um, booth, which is over there, yeah. a couple of hundred yards. And you're talking about AR. Yes. And so this is this is not what I'm expecting from team viewer. Mm -hmm. So just tell us. Um, obviously, you're doing R and D. You're doing development. You're yeah. looking at markets. But tell us about AR and like, someone some things we're not expecting from team viewer. Uh, I think that it, so it's. In, in short, it's just the attempt to get this positive help experience, this support mm. experience into the offline world, right? It's very clear if, you're, if, you, if two people are sitting on a computer and one is helping the other, that's very straightforward because you do screen sharing and you help people uh, on the computer. But what happens if a service technician is in front of a complex machine uh, and needs help and guidance where to, uh, where to repair, what to do, how to adjust, which dial? And then you can actually, this service technician would use his iPhone, tablet or whatever, use the camera and you would get help from an operator that is far away, mm. can be far away, and you guide it on the screen. So that's our attempt to bring it to the offline world and it's actually uh, getting lots of interest, media interest, but also customer interest because it's such an obvious use case mm. to have a central support facility where the expert knowledge sits mm. and then help people who are out in the field. Mm. It seems like the availability, um, cost-effective availability of cloud, data storage, it's kind of serendipity for your industry and for yeah. your business. So now people can get stuff, they can store stuff and transfer it and they yeah. need support and you're there to help them. But what about 
the connected world, um, the OEM relationships. I'm not asking you to, you know, divulge trade secrets, but yeah. do you look at car makers, uh, machinery makers, fencing makers? Yeah, we look at. Uh, I mean, as potential it, new business. Yeah. Now we look at we look at we look at this like in a partnership manner because we want to be integrated as solution where service cases happen. Right? Okay. And that can be in cars, it can be in all kinds of devices, it can be in other software suites where there is service cases within the software suite where TeamViewer should be used. And we really drive these integrations uh, with partners like ServiceNow, Salesforce and so forth. And we really go partner by partner by partner. Mm. Of course, if you get really vertical, like you mentioning the automotive stack mm. or something, this is very proprietary and mm. very vertical. So mm. that's a bit of a longer shot. Mm. Uh, but still, I think people are looking at TeamView as a horizontal solution that yeah. can be easily deployed, uh, customized, and used, and people innovate around it, and that's, a, it, that's our biggest edge, I would say. Okay. Um, if anybody is asking questions on the Slido app, we, we'll, we'll take a couple now if, if, if the guys have them ready for us. Um, while they're doing that, though, um, the new markets for TeamView, and I don't mean, I don't mean the new products, but um, 200 countries, yeah. um, there's not much more geography to go. Uh, no, but it's, it's the way how we go about geography. As okay. I mentioned before, it's really like uh, we have been, or we are serving all of these markets out of three hubs, and it's really a digital marketing, very centralistic approach, so to say. And we take this now country by country, uh, and there is huge growth potential from that. Also, we're growing up uh, the customer segment. So we started historically in the SMB segment, smaller businesses, and we're really growing up um, and, uh, and getting in the corporate world and enterprise world as well. Okay, and so um, for the, the SaaS business generally and what you do and for what other companies do, over the next few years, the evolution of this industry generally, um, uh, the evolution of your, of your business generally, competitors, where are they going to come from, um, or what you're likely to be doing. I mean, we, we talk technically about future as a service in this talk, yeah. but very specifically, um, TeamViewer and the way you see that evolving over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a multi-dimensional space, in my view, where you have all geographies, many use cases, many different types of devices and operating systems, and somebody has to connect all of those and has to make sense of the connection, have reliability, reliable connections in all use cases. With low bandwidth, high bandwidth, if you have 5G, perfect, then we can all connect to everything we want to, but if it's not, it has to mm. also work under low bandwidth environment. So that connectivity, that it always works, uh, that would be our edge, and then, together with customers, we co-design solutions around it. So getting more into the specific use cases of process automation, data collection, data analytics. So there's a lot of room to grow around this basic connectivity. And when do you start that process? Say when you, when you work um, collaboratively, with yeah. somebody, where does that start? Do they come to you, or do you do you, do you it's, reach out? No, it's uh, we reach out. They come to us. So if we're present here, we get into discussions. There's talks around customers or potential customers present projects to us, present to us ideas what they want to do, and then we engage uh, and engineer around it actually. And then we have proof of concept. It's project based, and then we see whether it's something we should build into our software suite and have it as a standard uh, feature. Uh, enabling technology that's likely to impact you and, and your sector generally over the next couple of years, you know, in providing uh, the service, what is it likely to be, do you think? What, what haven't we reached yet? You mentioned 5G, yeah. probably not too far away. Is, it, is there anything else? Uh, no, that's, the, that's the most pressing one, I would is say. I mean, depending on country, uh, I think some countries really need to speed up uh, on the rollout of 5G. If we talk about autonomous driving, all the sensors, imagine the, the number of devices that we will have there IoT devices or IoT gateways stuck to older legacy devices, the amount of data that's going to be collected and analyzed in real time. So if you look at our solution, it's all real time, uh, and that needs 5G. So that's the most obvious one where we need to push ahead. Um, and then in locations, say, sub-Saharan Africa or, uh, you know, remote communities, infrastructure, yeah. um, they, have a, you know, they have a requirement for TeamViewer, yeah. potentially. Um, what will likely, will it be you that adapts or approaches those markets with this future as a, as a service I, um, principle? Or will it be indigenous companies? Will you end up partnering with them? You know, how, how is that likely to work out for you? I think it's probably, uh, like you suggest, in the longer run, we will partner. Yeah. Currently, it's really, I mean, 
the companies in those markets who are interested in these solutions and want to build something modern around uh, IoT or remote controlling, they actually look very internationally for mm. uh, solutions and they find us. They actually find us. So we have business in many, many uh, African markets, for example, mm. because they just download the product and they just pay over the web. It's very easy to deploy. And it's a very easy uh, payment model and therefore we, are, we have good distribution there already. But if it's longer term, enterprise great solutions we will probably partner with locals mm, okay um the uh, we talked about the enabling technology that's likely to bring you is there anything specific that you see from a service and you know future as a service to be honest is a phrase that i think is difficult to define yeah, yeah. um but is there anything um from a project perspective that you're excited about now that's going to mature over the next year or so i think it's really we will see uh, the use of real-time data that will really take off now. I think there has been lots of talk over the last years, many projects, proof of concept, but I think mm. now it's really happening. It's also getting more into the broader landscape of industrial companies. So this is not just vertical projects, single projects with high budgets. It's really the, the mass of the customers going there. And I find that fascinating, the use cases around that. And also in Asia, China, for example, there's a lot of development there, which we try to be part of as well. And if you can, if you can flick back a few years and to think the challenges, okay, and you weren't imagining the future in such a broad way as you yeah. do now, but advice for startups, SaaS startups particularly, um, not so much things that you did wrong or you did different, but where, where would you head now if you were Oliver Steel of uh, 10 years ago? I think the, uh, I would, the, the big thing that we are leveraging and why we are so, so successful now is that we really had the, the viral effect at the beginning. Mm. So I would really consider to build a product which has a strong brand, strong functionality, which really distributes itself with strong word of mouth uh, referrals and then give this ecosystem time to develop and to really grow. And that's what was done very, very nicely in TeamU. I haven't done it, it wasn't my idea, other people did it. Very, very smart because then you can understand how many customers are really having um, repeated use of your product, who is sticky, who is just an occasional user. And once you understand that ecosystem and have big numbers behind it, mm. then you can start uh, migrate your business into a very nice subscription business. Uh, and that's what I would really look at, how sticky is your product and how good is it before you make something a subscription product where people might say occasional use is good, but as a subscription, it's a no-go for me because yeah. then you're dead before you even started. Okay, but you, you, you're on the way and it's looking pretty good for the moment. Yeah, we are done. We are effectively done. So uh, we, we have fully converted the company in a subscription business. I think by December, 98 of our billings, 98% wow. will wow. be a subscription. So wow. we're done. Effectively. Wow. Fantastic. Um, Oliver Steele, uh, the founder and CEO of TeamViewer, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.